Greetings, everyone, and thank you so much for attending the science seminar presented by the NSF National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON, which is operated by Battelle. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community among researchers at the intersection of environmental science, ecology, and NEON. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers for you who will present their unique perspectives on addressing a variety of ecological questions across scales. So this is our first um, seminar in the series that's going to go through um, the 2022-2023 season. There'll be nine talks in total, and we're so excited to have Dr. Sydney Record here kicking off the, the talks today. So before we turn it over to today's speaker, um, just a few logistics I'll go through. First, we have enabled the closed captioning feature for today's seminar. So if you'd like to use that, please find the CC button in the menu bar of Zoom. You do have to have an up-to-date version of Zoom for this to work, but you can go on ahead and enable the closed captioning. The webinar will be mostly a presentation followed by a Q&A session. As questions are coming to you, um, please add questions to the Q&A um, box. And then the moderators will facilitate discussion at the end. There will also might be an opportunity for you to raise your hand and ask a question. Um, we welcome contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation. And this is all outlined in our NEON code of conduct. So um, this would be for NEON staff as well as anyone participating in a NEON event. So um, when you get a chance, it's on our webpage, please do look at the NEON Participant Code of Conduct. I can't drop it in the chat, I realize, because there isn't a chat, but you can um, find this on our, on our webpage. Um, the talk will be recorded and made available after the fact. If you find it interesting, tell your friends. Um, we will post it on this seminar page and, and make that available for asynchronous viewing. And lastly, to complement our monthly science seminars, we're hosting related data skills webinars where folks can uh, learn more about how to access and use NEON data. So the registration for those is actually available on the same webpage, on the, on the NEON Science webpage, where we have all this information about the science seminar series. If you just scroll down, we've got these related data skills webinars. We'd love to see you at those. Um, if you're interested, uh, please go ahead and check those out. All right, now I'd love to turn it over to Bridget Haas to introduce today's speaker. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Sydney Record today, who recently joined the University of Maine Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Conservation Biology. Prior to that, Dr. Record was the Associate Provost and Associate Professor of Quantitative Ecology at Bryn Mawr College. And her research focuses on two main themes, which are understanding the processes that drive species distributions and determining drivers of genetic trait and species diversity across large landscapes. Sydney has incorporated NEON data in her research since the early days of NEON, and we're excited to have her give a talk today on her work compiling data on land use histories of the NEON sites, which is an important component of understanding the ecological processes at these sites. So with that, I'll welcome Dr. Record to speak. Thanks. Hi, thanks so much for, for having me. And I'm, uh, thank you to, to Bridget and, and Sam and Eric and all the NEON staff. So today what I'd like to talk about is the, the notion of having a, a database of current and past land use of NEON sites. And I'll, I'll begin with a, a story in research. Let's see. All right, so first of all, before I start that story though, I'd like to recognize that I'm going to be presenting work that's been really a truly a team science effort. Um, this group of principal investigators, Phoebe Zarnetsky from Michigan State, Angela Strecker from Western Washington University, and Ben Baser from University of Florida, and I, in the early days of NEON in around 2015, received an eager NEON award from NSF to start working with the early NEON data. And we've worked with a whole cast of really excellent students and, and postdocs throughout that time to do this work. And so I just wanna recognize that this has been truly a team effort and I'll give shout outs to individuals as we go, go through that. So today I'd like to talk about the need for a land use database for all of the NEON sites. And I'll provide some context for 
um, for thinking about why we need land use information. Then I'll describe how I'm working on building such a database of land use for NEON sites. And then also talk about how there are some different synergies between the airborne observation platform and, and thinking about land use. So as you all know, NEON measures many different things um, using a standardized protocol across dozens of sites in the United States and beyond. And um, the, the types of measurements made are everything from the, the small mammals scurrying around on the, the forest floor, all the way up to the, the flux of, of greenhouse gases in the air above the sites. And so NEON is this huge, rich data source that we've never had in ecology that allows us to answer these interesting macroecological questions. Now, if we go back in time and think about the early days of when they were first scoping this idea of NEON, um, there were a lot of listening sessions and working groups that the National Science Foundation funded. Um, one of these was hosted at Harvard Forest, uh, where I've done a lot of work, which happens to be a NEON site and also a long-term ecological research site. And so this gives you an idea of what people were thinking about when, when starting to consider this observatory. Um, and here you can see things like coupled human environment system really stand out in the title of this white paper that was written um, to, to the National Science Foundation as they were thinking about NEON. And you see under here two broad goals, understanding how land use change and climate variation affect ecological systems, and then the ability to forecast future dynamics of those systems. And I want you to keep those two broad goals in mind as we walk through this, this research story. So then we get to 2008 and NEON's becoming more of, of a reality, more than just a vision. Um, and as they're thinking about planning out NEON, um, there was this paper, um, that this commentary that appeared in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. And this paper featured you know, the vision for what types of data would be collected at NEON. And so in the Stommel diagram, which was figure two of this paper, you can see time on the x-axis, spatial scale on the y-axis. And then those, those blue boxes indicate different data products that, um, that people, were, people like Dave Schimmel um, and Forrest Hoffman and Michael Keller and William Hargrove um, were envisioning as being the data products that NEON would produce. Um, and some of those have come to be and some of those have not. Uh, the fundamental instrumentation unit um, is all of the, the sensors that, that NEON has in the sensor data. Um, the fundamental sentinel unit is referring to the sentinel, sentinel organisms um, that, that NEON measures both in aquatic and terrestrial environments. The airborne observation platform, AOP, um, it has come to fruition. But what was left out uh, as the, the network was built out was this land use analysis package. And so fast forward to 2018, where we're working on um, our, our early Eager Neon Award from NSF. And we're in this paper by Quinton Reed, which was one of the first papers using the organismal data from neon sites. We were looking at um, intraspecific trait variation in body size, size of rodents um, from the neon observatory. And what we were seeing was that there's a lot of variation in the data that we were getting in, at sites. And we weren't really sure how, you know, if you look at the data as an end user, you see a lot of variability in the data. And sometimes you wonder is, you know, what processes exactly are leading to that variability. And having been working for, for many years at one of the neon sites, Harvard Forest, where they did a lot of um, small mammal uh, trapping in the early days before they, they built out the whole observatory as they were trying to test the protocols, I knew that there was a lot of variation in land use history at the site and that influences the, the forest dynamics at Harvard Forest. And I wondered, you know, if you were, if you're using neon data, do you actually understand that there's variability in the historic land use at the site that then plays out in the ecosystems that we see today and in the small mammals? And and it really got me to thinking about, you know, how much of the variability that we're that people might see in neon data could be from 
land use um, and people's interactions with the environment that doesn't get accounted for in our analyses. And then NEON became fully operational in 2019. And as I mentioned before, due to um, budgetary constraints, that land use analysis package never came to be. And when NEON was fully operational in 2019, the main way that they're accounting for um, any type of land use is by linking to information from the National Land Cover Database in the, in the data products. And that's not to discount this as a useful source of, of information, but it gives you kind of a static snapshot of what the land cover is um, at a given site and for a given plot. Um, and and it, it is useful information, um, but it's it's based on uh, Landsat, which is a, a NASA uh, satellite that is Earth observing, and it has a 30 meter resolution. Um, and so what this means is that any kind of finer resolution information on disturbance or land use history, um, or even current land use are kind of missing pieces to the NEON puzzle when you're trying to understand the variability in the data that you see. And why is this important? So uh, we were thinking about uh, synergies between LTER, the Long-Term Ecological Research Network and NEON um, in, a, in a group that met at NCs uh, around 2016. Um, and in that group, we, were, we started talking about kind of information that could come from LTER sites that could be relevant for NEON sites. And this, is a figure from a paper um, in Earth Futures that's first authored by uh, Julia Jones that I co-authored with her. Um, and, and in this figure, what I did was I laid out kind of historic information on land use from the LTER network and then the neon tower plots, which are shown by those, um, those dark triangles. And I just wanna also you know, acknowledge that Harvard Forest is situated on Nipmuc land. And, um, and I'm going to recognize, um, recognize uh, traditional peoples who have lived on these different lands at the neon sites as, as a way of kind of recognizing um, that one of the things I'd like to do with this work is move past um, colonial settlement era land use, um, but I haven't quite gone there yet, but I wanna at least provide that recognition of the, the value for traditional ecological knowledge. And so what we see though in this map is, 1830s land use. Um, so that's, you know, just after about 50 years after European settlement. And um, we've got this all mapped out for Harvard Forest. And you can see that the different neon tower plots uh, where a number of measurements are made on the vegetation, the soil microbes, um, soil moisture, et cetera, are all laid out. And you can see that they, they fall on different land uses. And you may think, well, what does that matter? You know, 1830s was uh, was 200 years ago. That that shouldn't have any influence on the ecosystem. But at Harvard Forest, there's been a lot of work done on how land use can affect ecosystems that we see today. So this is a figure from a paper by Glenn Motzkin, who worked for a long time at Harvard Forest. So it was published in Ecological Monographs. And in, in, in Western Massachusetts, this isn't at the Harvard Forest site, but nearby, um, we see very different soils um, and plant types that are reliant upon what the former land use history was in the 1830s. So in areas where, um, where you didn't have any sort of, of tilling or pasture, you, which would be shown on the, the left-hand side of this, this graphic, you see a, a whole different suite of species, in this case, scrub oak. And if you look at the soil horizons, you can see that you have very clear organic and mineral horizons that haven't been mixed. In contrast, on the right in this diagram would be another area that has completely different vegetation, um, in this case, pitch pine. And if you look at the soil horizons, you can see that they're very mixed. And so even though we had that land use in, in the 1830s over 200 years or around 200 years ago, we can still see signatures of that, that um, ecological legacy of land use. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, these are some soil cores I actually um, you know, have pictures of um, from sites where there was tilling and no tilling at, at Harvard Forest. And you can see that there's very clear, the, the top soil core would be an area where there was 
tilling for agriculture in the 1800s. Um, and you can see that mixture of the organic and the mineral horizons. Whereas on the bottom soil core would be an area um, where we have completely different vegetation where there was not historically tilling. Um, and this then plays out not just in the soils, but also in the vegetation that we see at sites. So this is a paper by Dave Orwig from Harvard Forest that was published this year. Uh, and this is from data from the forest geo uh, plot of the Smithsonian network. And in the panel on the left, um, in that map with the different shades of green, it shows when, um, when there was last cutting at different sites. Um, in the, the Harvard Forest Forest Geo plot. And you can see that dark green olive color is um, an area that, that has never been cut um, because it was permanent woodlot. Um, so it, it was never really cut um, in that and was uh, left intact for, um, for logging for heating homes. And you can see that um, in the right-hand side, we have maps of stem maps of the major species at the Harvard Forest, um, forest Geo plot. And you can see that um, there's very different species dynamics in those areas. So not surprisingly in that permanent woodlot um, on the upper left-hand side there, um, where you can see Suga canadensis is, is one of the later successional species at Harvard Forest, that's Eastern Hemlock. And you can see that you can you can see that kind of U shape or horseshoe shape where that permanent woodlot was. So we can see differences in the forest even today in the soils and in the vegetation from this former land use. And that's why I think it's really important for us to be considering this kind of land use, um, both past and current in thinking about the, the neon sites and the variability that we might see in all of the different measurements. So hopefully that convinces you of why we would need a database of land use, both past and current for neon sites. And I'd like to go into a little bit of information about how we've been building out such a database. And I just wanna give some context for this. Um, the reason why I'm so interested in building this database once again, is because I have a, a grant that's funded looking at how um, different drivers could influence intraspecific trait variation and then how that could influence biodiversity patterns. And um, as you can see in, in this proposal diagram that I have from the grant, the NSF grant that's funding this work, past land use and, and current kind of disturbance and disturbance regime are, are pieces of the puzzle when we're thinking about those different drivers. Um, and, and this is, really nice to look at in a neon framework because we can then look at um, how different scales of influence vary for these different drivers at the plot, site, and domain scale, given the nice nested hierarchical design of neon. So that's kind of what I'm using, planning to use this data for. But I also think that it's, it's definitely relevant for thinking about many of the other neon data streams, um, such as the, the flux tower data streams and instances where you might have the flux tower um, footprint on different types of land uses. Um, and then also for, for the AOP um, data as well and being able to, to validate information on disturbance um, generated from the AOP. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later on. But I'm, I'm hoping that this, this database that we're putting together will, will not just be useful for my own purpose of thinking about interspecific trait variation and biodiversity, but will also be relevant for everyone who's using NEON data. Um, and, I'd, and I'd love for people to reach out to me and I wanna just reiterate that this will be made openly available um, as soon as we feel that it, it's ready and it's getting very, very close. So in terms of methods, um, what we've been doing, um, and I should say that this has been the work of a whole suite of undergraduate students who've been working with me um, at my former institution, Bryn Mawr College, and through the Harvard Forest REU program. Um, and so I just wanna recognize the, the great um, deal of effort that's been put in by undergraduates and just how awesome undergraduate research can be. I feel like that sometimes doesn't get recognized as much in the academy as it should. Um, but I'll, I'll walk you through our methods um, of, of curating land use history and current land use. Um, and it's really a, a, a large kind of 
web that we cast for data collection. And then there's a, a great deal of digitization that has to go into taking um, historic maps and converting them into um, geolocated uh, shape files, and then also standardizing the data across sites so that it will be useful for these cross-site analyses. And when we first start out with our, our data collection, one of the things that we've had to, to reconcile and think about is that the types of management varies greatly across sites. Um, and so in some sites, we have kind of federal or state ownership and the, the type of land use history and land use data available are very different at these sites relative to other sites. Um, so federal and state owned um, lands are sometimes national parks like Yellowstone or the Great Smoky Mountains. Other sites we have as kind of extensions of universities. And so these are oftentimes private sites um, and they're, um, but they're, they're kind of under this um, educational mission. So we have the Harvard Forest or the um, University of Notre Dame Environmental Research Center. Um, and then we have purely private sites. So we're, you know, such as um, Steigerwald or the Jones Environmental Research Center. So we really have to kind of consider different methods for data collection about land use history um, for these different types of land owners. Um, and what we found is that for federal and state um, owned properties, we're oftentimes able to query across different existing archives and databases. And oftentimes these even come with geolocated georeference data. Um, for private sites, we found that it's been most helpful to pick up the phone and have direct contact with some of the NEON site managers who can then help us to understand who the different owners are and how to best approach them. We, we're trying to be very mindful in this process of not kind of overtaxing um, landowners because we don't want them to be, to kind of regret being a neon site because they're getting bombarded by, by requests from people. Um, and then with extensions of universities, we found that it's kind of a combination of di direct interviews with people at the universities um, and, and then also accessing databases and archives uh, of research that's been performed at those universities. And I just wanna recognize that this process of data collection is very much um, grounded in the social sciences. Um, and what we've been using really is um, a snowball sampling approach. And so, especially in those instances where we're reaching out to landowners, you know, we, we contact the, the NEON site manager first and then they give us leads and, and we follow those leads. And sometimes the leads lead to nothing. Um, and sometimes those leads lead us down a whole other rabbit hole of people that we can talk to. Um, and this, you know, to a scientist who maybe doesn't do um, social science, this might sound very, very, um, you know, biased, um, but it's important to recognize that this is, is kind of a, a well-known social science method called snowball sampling. But you do have to recognize that you have these kind of social networks and you might have someone who has, who's very networked that can give you a lot of resources, but there will be some bias in, in who you're actually getting information from. So we just like to recognize that that's, that's the approach um, and that, that it's used commonly in the social sciences, um, but it does have its inherent biases in terms of the social networks that you're able to reach through this approach. So what do the data actually look like? So in terms of the type of data that, that we found, this is from a site called Treehaven um, and it's Potawatomi land. And, you know, sometimes we just find very old maps um, that we're able to um, get, even sometimes we've, we've made trips down to the National Archives down at, um, at University of Maryland College Park. And we take scans of old maps um, and sometimes, those old maps will have information on things like harvests um, and just a date, as you can see in the polygon. Um, we then have to geo-reference those old maps um, to then make them into shapefiles. So sometimes it's, it's a matter of actually converting paper maps um, that have been hand-drawn into, into digitized shapefiles. Sometimes we'll get an old map that's maybe from a publication um, and, and in that case, we have to take the, we have to link the information from the old map and geo-reference that as well as 
pull out data on uh, relevant data from different data tables that accompanied the publication. So this is an example from Oak Ridge National Lab um, down in Tennessee, which is on Cherokee land. Um, other times we're able to get information, not necessarily on, on land use, but on historic land cover um, that, that we're able to, to glean from aerial photographs. So this is a nice um, example of a collection of aerial photographs that were uh, made available to us from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Maryland. Um, and here, once again, we have to take that aerial image, uh, geo-reference it, and then classify, um, do a classification of the different land cover types. And in instances where we have land cover information rather than land use, we're, um, we're using the land cover designations of the National Land Cover Database. Um, so this is just a, an example of what a time series from those maps from CERC would look like. Um, going from 1938 up to 1976. Um, and you can see that the, the land cover type is shown um, by the legend that's on the right-hand side of the slide. And forest is the really dark green, um, ranging up to a lighter green, which would be open um, pasture or um, grassland space. Um, and then uh, you can see structures on there as well. Um, and what you can see overall is that there's been a lot of um, reforestation um, in, this, in this footprint over time. Other times, um, just to give you a, another kind of taste of the types of land use data, um, we'll have information on, um, on grazing. Um, and this is an example from the Santa Rita Experimental Range, uh, which on the left-hand map, you can see all of those black lines are the pasture fences for the different um, pens that the, the cows are put into. And on, on that map, those little red dots indicate all of the, um, the neon sampling plots. And so that cluster that you see up in the right-hand top corner is, um, are, are the vegetation plots that go around the tower. So the good news is that for Santa Rita, the whole footprint tower falls in one pasture. Um, that's not always the case for all the sites though, um, in terms of it falling in one area of land use. But what you can see is the neon sampling plots really fall um, in a lot of different pastures. And on the right-hand side here, you can see the um, overall grazing intensity and animal units per hectare per year um, for each of those pastures. And the purple here, um, you know, the, the dark purpley blue color um, means a higher intensity of, of number of heads of cattle per year um, grazing a particular area. Um, gray means that those were years without data. But what you can see is that over time, we've had a lot of variability in the amount of grazing at those sites. Um, and, the, and we're able to, you know, at, at many sites, this is also just illustrating that we have data that are coming up until present. So although I'm focusing a lot on the kind of historical aspect of this database, there's also a lot of rich information on what's happening currently that could then feed into thinking about these kind of coupled human natural systems at these sites. So in, in coming up with the database, we're thinking a lot about data provenance. And as you, for those of you who've worked with NEON data, you know that there's different level designations for the different types of data products that NEON has. So you, some of it are L0 data, which tend to be more true to the raw form of data that were collected. L1 data um, might, or level one data might be a more of a summarized um, version of the data. And so NEON uses this level designation, um, as do many NASA um, data products as well. And it's just a way of kind of keeping raw data separate from more derived data um, so that you, you have an idea of how the data is changing as people do their analyses. So the level zero or L0 data in this database are really just our raw shape files of those Di different digitized maps. Um, and so it was really those kind of shape files I was showing in the previous slides. And, you know, a challenge with, with the data that come out of those kind of raw shape files that we collect is that the variables differ by site. Um, so 
as you can imagine, there's very different types of land use across all of the different neon sites. Some sites are forested and being harvested. Other sites have different amounts of grazers on them and so forth. Um, and so these L0 data shape files really reflect the variables that are from an original source of data. We're also generating an L1 or level one data product, which will be standardized disturbance and land use variables across all of the sites. And so we're, we're generating um, shape files for all the sites that correspond to the L0 data, but have um, information on disturbance type, the start and end date of the disturbance, the time since the disturbance, the intensity and frequency, and in cases where it's um, applicable, the, the national land cover databases for land cover, classes for land cover. Um, in terms of the progress of the database, we've been focusing our efforts mostly on the terrestrial sites um, with some effort that I'll talk about in just a moment on the aquatic sites being slightly different. Um, but so far we have information for um, 33, so about three quarters of our terrestrial sites. Um, and we're still plugging away and, and trying to get more information on the other sites. Um, in terms of data origins, most of the data are coming from existing shapefiles from open source databases. 22% um, are coming from site contacts, and then 14% are coming from digitized figures or aerial photos. And you'll see that that doesn't sum to 100 because some, um, some data sets actually um, are coming in both, um, can be categorized as both um, within a site. Um, in terms of what the disturbance types look like, um, here's uh, an example of the forested sites across NEON. Um, and I should just note um, that a student in my research group at Bryn Mawr, who was also an RE student at Harvard Forest, Sam Olivares Maija, did an incredible amount of work on this project. Um, and you can see that in terms of disturbances at forested sites at, of NEON, most of it's due to cutting. Um, and then the next kind of disturbance that's most common is planting um, regeneration. Um, and we have some wildfire, uh, but this gives you a sense of kind of the types of disturbances that we're seeing. Uh, Frances Romero did her senior thesis on the rangeland sites at NEON. Um, and in the rangeland sites, um, the, the most common disturbance type is grazing. Uh, but we're also seeing a lot of prescribed fire as well. Um, I did talk about some challenges that we've had in terms of making this database. Um, and these are some of the things that we're kind of chewing on as we as we finalize this and, and before making it publicly available. Um, and you know, some of the challenges that we've had are that at some sites the data are, exist, um, really great fine scale information on land use. Um, but it's proprietary. Um, and so an example would be the Jones Environmental Research Center has collated a great wealth of information about land use, but they're just simply not willing to share it. Um, other times um, the, the data um, might be proprietary um, because they're owned by a park and may be sensitive if they were used for, um, for studying endangered species. Um, so those are some of the issues that we've, we've hit. Um, and then finally, I just want to also recognize that this is a lot of the data that we've been able to collect for this project has really been um, post-colonial history, um, but we'd really like to decolonize this project and have more pre-colonial history. So if there's anyone out there who'd like to collaborate on that, um, please, please reach out to me. Um, I'd like to just end with a, a couple of ways that we've been thinking about how we could synergize information from the AOP and land use. Um, and, you know, one of the ways that we've been thinking about doing that is um, getting information on kind of finer scale features than are provided by the National Land Cover Database. Um, and one way that we can do that is using the NEON um, LIDAR data. So this is a, a hillshade map that's generated from the NEON AOP LIDAR data. And it, it's really cool to look at this fine resolution um, digital terrain map because you can actually start to see features um, on the landscape such as, as roads and rivers and stream cuts. Um, and so what we've been putting together is a linear features database um, for the neon sites, um, because even though you have um, 
information like the census roads and the national hydrography data set on streams, you're able to capture, um, shown in pink, a lot of undetected linear features uh, by looking at, at these uh, high resolution LIDAR maps. And so just to give you a better sense of that, um, here is one of those areas zoomed in. And you can see where the US Census Road um, shown in brown um, lies. And you can see kind of the line for that misses just a little bit, but you can tell more or less that there's a road there and there might be edge effects that are important for thinking about your ecological system. You can also see where the streams are, but here you can see an unmarked road. Um, and so there's a lot of dirt roads that go through neon sites um, that, that would go undetected um, otherwise. And roads, as we all know, can be dispersal corridors for invasive species. You can have edge effects um, around a road. And so it's very important to kind of know where these linear features are. So we've been going through and we've, we've, we've done this kind of exercise of um, drawing additional linear features onto all of the NEON sites, um, AOP uh, digital terrain LIDAR maps. And we've gone through and also looked at bare earth images from Google Earth, um, which has high resolution imagery to actually confirm um, that we're not missing a lot of roads. And, and we're, we're doing a good job in terms of that, that, um, that validation. Uh, we're also using some of our historic data sets as well to validate this database. Um, and we should have a data product soon to be released um, that, uh, that should be coming out probably in the beginning of next year. Um, and once again, that's for all terrestrial and aquatic sites with AOP data for the NEON um, sites. Okay, the one other way that we're thinking about synergies uh, between remotely sensed um, data and our, our land use data um, is, is in thinking about how you can remotely sense disturbance. So it kind of in tandem with this work, um, another piece of our project uh, that, that Jasper Van Donink um, from Phoebe Zarnetsky's lab at Michigan State University is doing is taking the, um, the AOP data and the Landsat data and trying to come up with disturbance metrics for the NEON sites, as well as all the places in between. So really thinking about how you could use remotely sensed data to kind of take inferences from NEON sites and then scale them out and fill in um, all the in-between places um, that, are, that are in the country. And um, remotely sensing disturbance um, presents one challenge in that you have to have some sort of, of ground validation information. Um, and so this is just an example of how we've been thinking about how we can use the information from our land use database to actually provide some level of validation for, from remotely sensed disturbance layers. And this is just an example from um, Bartlett Experimental Forest, which is in the Northeast domain. And Bartlett is in um, the New England temperate forest and has, has a long logging history. It's a, a US Forest Service site. And um, this is just an example of some of our land use data um, for Bartlett. And all of those different sections that you're seeing there are um, different compartments, forest, um, forest service compartments, where there's different management. And we have, um, we have essentially uh, the logging histories for all of these different compartments. Um, and some of these compartments go range from being unmanaged, so they haven't been logged, to being very highly managed um, and, and logged repeatedly. And so what we've been trying to think of are ways that we can use our land use data that, that we have information on to then validate some of Jasper's disturbance layers. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, Jasper is used using Landsat, um, which is a NASA Earth Observing Satellite that, that generates the National Land Cover Database, um, and also AOP data, and doing essentially a time, uh, pixel by pixel time series analysis to see how the spectral signature um, of, of each pixel changes through time uh, to then have, um, have a, a way to detect change and model change detection. Um, and he's, one thing that, um, that Jasper's really thinking about in his project is how not just looking at a pixel through time, but also the importance of really thinking about 
the space that surrounds a pixel, so the neighborhood around a, a particular pixel that you're modeling. Um, and he's been playing around a little bit with an REU student, um, Chikata Hart from Michigan State University, um, thinking about if you could actually do not just a temporal segmentation of the spectral signature through time, but actually a spatial segmentation that's kind of object based and you're thinking about how that spatial object changes through time to then detect disturbance and also attribute that disturbance. And this is just, you know, to show you that um, these are the kind of spatial object segmentations that that Jasper's been coming up with, these all those like little boxes. Um, and what we've been doing is using those to kind of val taking those and comparing them to our validation data. So that's just to get you thinking. I know a lot of people are using the AOP data for NEON and just to get people thinking about how this land use database can be a resource for thinking about um, getting disturbance information um, or change through time information and linking it back to on the ground measurements. So this is just another in situ um, data resource for people. So I'm getting um, close to the end of my talk, which I'm hoping we'll have you know, plenty of time for, for questions, because um, I always think that's the best part. Um, and you know, what I'd like people to consider as the takeaway from this talk is that is, is really to go back to that planning document from 2006 for NEON um, that was a white paper that was generated by folks at Harvard Forest um, who are thinking about kind of this goal of understanding climate change and coupled human natural systems, and then being able to make projections so that we can understand what might happen to our ecosystems um, and biodiversity in the future. And I really think that if we're going to, you know, if we're going to be trying to understand and forecast out into the future, um, we really need to be thinking about how the ecosystems and biodiversity that we see may have been influenced by the past. Um, and that can actually help us to inform how we're going to model out those projections um, and think about the future and, and what the future holds for, for, for our children. And I just wanna give, uh, take a couple last minutes to give a little bit of plugs. Um, so this is uh, an ESA, Ecological Society of America water cooler chat that's going to be coming up in October. Um, it's graciously organized um, by Teresa Murad, who uh, is run seeds for the ESA um, Society. And um, it's part of a, a series that uh, is, is led by um, the Landscape Exchange Network, RCN, that's led by Andrew Elmore, which is really thinking about how to get social data into thinking about neon sites. And we'll be talking a little bit about this project um, you know, just for like about 10 minutes. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how environmental data science um, is a way to actually broaden participation in ecology and, and environmental sciences. Um, and there's been a lot of talk this year about how field sites can be a bit unwelcoming um, to people and um, especially people from traditionally underrepresented groups. And, um, and data science kind of provides a nice, um, a nice avenue for, for I, I believe, um, bringing together more people from diverse backgrounds in ecology. So we'll be talking about that, and that will feature Danasia Ville Saint, an NSF post baccalaureate fellow um, who I've been working with, and also Sam, who did a lot of the um, the work on the forested land use history. And I also just want to give a, a quick plug that. Um, I've just moved to UMaine. Um, it's very nice here. There's a, you know, it's about an hour from the coast, an hour from Katahdin, um, and uh, there's a lot of positions open in my research group that I'd I'd love to hear from people about. Um, we have two postdocs. Um, all of these are kind of related to neon in some way. So there's a postdoc on neon land use to continue this work and think about interspecific trait variation in niches. Uh, there's a PhD on linking neon phenology data and herbarium data um, to, to think about phenological sensitivity. And then there's a NASA funded postdoc um, on scaling forest diversity and using neon AOP data along with other NASA data sets. So please reach out if you have any questions about that. And please help me spread the word. We'd love to get some great applicants 
I'll start reviewing applications on September 30th. And I just want to end by saying thank you to, um, to especially to the NEON staff. So I, thank you, Sam, for organizing and, um, and Bridget for the invite. Um, I'd also just like to recognize, um, you know, many longstanding collaborators, Eric Sokol, Kate Tebow. Um, if I'm not naming you, I apologize, but there's just been so many people from NEON who have been so helpful for various aspects of this project and so many others over the years. And I just really value the insights and, um, and wisdom from the, the NEON staff. Um, and I also wanna thank the National Science Foundation for keeping NEON running and, um, and for, for also funding our projects. So at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful talk, Sydney. Uh, very, very interesting work. Um, I am not seeing any questions in the Q&A box, but for all our attendees, please, if you have some questions, do either go ahead and type them in the Q&A, or you should have a feature where you can raise hand at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we can unmute you and give you a chance to ask your question to Sydney if you would like. Um, Bridget or Eric, did either of you have a question you wanted to start with or I could I could throw one out there? Yeah, Bridget. Um, I just have a quick logistical question. Um, so Sydney, are you looking at, are you pro providing maps of the entire flight area or are you focusing mostly on the observation? That's a great question. So we've, we've for the detailed land use data, it's it's where the observational data are. Um, for now, I'd like to kind of write another grant to to bump that out. It's just we had to kind of we 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 bit off a lot to chew through already. <laughs> um, uh, but for the um, for the roads layers, that's the whole AOP. Okay, great. Yeah. And then we do have a question from the Q and A from Rachel Swanson. She's asking. Curious how this work uses or could use the NEON site management and event reporting data for current disturbance events. Yeah, so that is a fantastic question. And um, I've been talking for years with Mike San Clements about that data product um, and, and thinking about it. And so I think that, you know, what I, the, the short answer is we haven't used that data resource a ton yet. Um, but I, as I'm kind of pivoting from kind of getting a broad scale brush of the of the database um, created, that's what I want to be thinking about moving forward. Um, and also, you know, I and and I'm I'm also interested in kind of talking with um, with the neon field crews too about like how that reporting actually happens and thinking about ways that we can make it um, like more just as NEON uses standardized data protocols, protocols for everything else, how we could maybe standardize how field crews are actually thinking through that process too. So I think that's like definitely like my next step of things that I'm wanting to think about. Um, and yeah, Sam's like, let's do it. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but that's definitely, it's an untapped resource. And I also think that it's a resource that with community guidance could be, um, maybe maybe even more impactful. Kelly, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hi, hey Sydney, this is great. Um, thank you so much. Thank it's you. amazing to see how much you've done um, and so glad you're doing it. And I know you've used the watershed um, boundaries mm -hmm. for the road layers, um, but as um, an aquatic ecologist, I, and I know this is asking a lot, but like, obviously the whole drainage area impacts mm -hmm. the aquatic site. And so in addition, and some of our watersheds are small enough that AOP does fly them all. And so it, is there a, a future plan five, 10 years down the road to actually do the land use history of the watershed, not just roads? Yeah, that that's definitely something that we'd love to do. And I feel like I so I'm a little biased because I do mostly terrestrial work, yeah. although we do have an aquatic scientist, Angela Strecker, in our group. Um, but because I was kind of tasked with the land use, I've been a bit biased with the terrestrial goggles. Um, but that's definitely something that we're thinking about. Um, and we would, you know, we the other piece is so a few ideas here. Um, you know, 
in some instances, we are limited a bit because of the footprint of, of, the, AO, of the AOP. Um, and just for, for aquatic sites, just it, if I'm thinking about like roads layers and stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, we're thinking about ways that we could essentially kind of potentially use like drones to get finer resolution on the, um, you know, on a watershed area and use um, artificial intelligence to draw the roads in the future now that we have a validation data set. So that's one piece. Um, the other piece that's going to help with scaling up beyond kind of the sites that we have um, is at least for land use from 1984 to present, um, Jasper's disturbance layers. So he's he's been like agonizing over getting that set up for running on the whole continental United States. And so that would then be able, enable us to scale even, you know, at different size hucks moving up um, different watershed sizes, designations. And then for the kind of really, really um, like historic fine land use and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I would, I'm, I would love to kind of keep working on this. And the nice thing about NEON is that it aligns really well with some of our careers, <laughs> you know? So this is yeah. kind of like something I'm hoping to continue working on until I'm an old lady. Um, and, but <laughs> I hope to get it to, you know, so that would be kind of like, you know, a, a couple steps further um, in terms of thinking about scaling out the land use. Great, thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I thought Dave Barnett had his hand, had his hand up a little while ago. It kind of went up and down. So should we call on um, Dave Barnett to ask? ask? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, wonderful talk as always. I am involved with Rachel and others on that um, site management data, which is new as a formal data product. And as with many of our data products, we have these external advisor groups, technical working groups, and we don't actually have one of those for that data product yet. And it's something we've talked about. And so um, getting more, you know, more feedback from you and others like, you know, to diversify would be a really helpful thing, I think. Um, and we have thought a lot about how we get that data. And I think just like how more in the historical information that you collected, we run into a lot of different um, situations by site with respect to how much they know about what's going on and you know mm -hmm. the scale at which they're willing to or not willing but uh, capable of or actually actionably can report information on so all these things I think directly are relevant to the information you're collecting so I just wanted to make that that we will likely reach out to you for more on that uh, my mm -hmm. second question is I've had a lot to do along with Rachel on placing our neon terrestrial plots at sites and so it was fun to see and I've looked at this kind of thing a lot, um, you know, how mm -hmm. the plots showed up on the, I forget if it was a harvest map you showed, at, well, I think it was at Cirque or somewhere in Domain 2. Or Santa Rita oh, was that what the it like was? little red dots with the pasture yep. fences, yeah. And we've looked at this kind of thing a lot. And, you know, uh, early on, I was talking to some folks at Kanza about it. And they said, well, if you don't pay attention to the different, because there they have very specific spatially grazing and fire, mm -hmm. and various combinations of those if you don't. And we just don't have enough plots to capture all those. So it was interesting to see that map. But I thought just if you could speak a little bit more about how you've seen those things overlay um, on other you know, history and how we've done, it would be interesting. Feedback. Yeah. So I mean, I think that you know, and my understanding from the the terrestrial, the TOS design, the um, I'm sorry, I'm speaking in neon acronyms, the terrestrial observation system design is that, um, hopefully I got the acronym right, um, <laughs> is that that they, uh, that they strata, my understanding from, I think it was your paper, Dave, um, yeah. was about how you stratified by land cover type, right? And so um, I think, yeah, there's definitely, in instances like Kanza, um, also places like Ordway Swisher, where you have, especially where you have these like prescribed burns, um, sometimes even um, nested within like an experimental design, that land cover doesn't quite capture that disturbance. Um, and so, so I mean, I think I'm, and this isn't me being critical at all. I'm like so grateful to everyone at Neon and all of the thoughtful you know, work that you've put into everything since the inception of the observatory. Um, I just think that you can't include everything, right? And if you had to have that kind of land use analysis package group, um, then you could have, you know, thought through all of this. But I do kind of think that the NLCD classes don't always capture that kind of disturbance. And 
Um, and I do think that there's opportunity moving forward, you know, to, to also be thinking about how the AOP could be better leveraged um, to capture some of these disturbances. Like it, it is challenging to kind of have people reporting, right? Um, and I know that there's a lot of turnover in field crews from summer to summer and keeping that consistent and like what you deem a disturbance and, and all of that. Um, but I do think that, you know, there might be a case that could be made for more frequent um, AOP flights that could capture maybe some of this disturbance. Um, so yeah, just something to think about. And then, um, yeah, like the, the Phenocam data is interesting too. I remember talking with Kyla Dahl and, um, you know, she was about to go from Michigan State. She was gonna go sample down at Talladega um, for one of her um, eager awards. Uh, and she said like, she was planning her sampling trip and she like just out of like on a whim turned on the Phenocam <laughs> or like checked the, the Phenocam information for Talladega and it, and it was on fire. And she was like, oh, I guess we're not gonna go there for a while. <laughs> so, I mean, there might be other ways that we could leverage different data sources. Um, but I think a TWIG, a technical working group on this topic would be great. Um, and that lens RCN might be another good place to recruit people. I'm on the steering committee for that. So I'd be happy to help set that up. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Yeah, there, yeah. I think yeah, a lot of that comes back to sample size and with so many things at NEON in terms of the plot distribution, mm -hmm. trying to do things and maybe for better or for worse, we so often try to do things consistently, apply things consistently across sites. And so to think about all these, um, you know, different sites are obviously exposed to different disturbances and then to stratification always adds complexity to the design. So um, to have some kind yeah. of double stratification further complicated it. So I appreciate your answer and I know you're not being critical. So, you know, it's one of those things we did wrestle with some and um, certainly we didn't get everything right, but it, it, we do have a, Rachel and I were sort of working on a what did we miss paper and looking at other mm. things besides NLCD yeah. to see how we're covering. Um, mm -hmm. And that's been pretty interesting. So maybe we'll even run that past you too before we, we cool. submit. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Chris, jump in for the next one. Okay. Hi. Uh, well, thank you. It's really cool to see researchers that are kind of um, uh, maintaining like some of the historical pieces of the uh, observatory that might be otherwise forgotten. So that that's really great. My question is just, um, do you, I know you haven't released this database yet, but do you mm -hmm. have any like papers that are rearing to go or nuggets of data that that will like that will use this data to explain any variation in any of the observational uh, data we've collected so far yeah so um the answer is yes there's a lot of stuff in the queue um i was i kind of like on a whim became associate provost for a year last year and it kind of sucked the life out of me um but we've got papers looking at mostly at organismal diversity and intraspecific trait variation responses to these. Um, and just because I, I'm more of a um, community ecologist. Uh, so Dinesha um, Vilsaint, the postback who I mentioned in that ESA water cooler chat, we've got a really interesting paper that she's just worked that, that she's worked up the analysis for and is going to write up this fall on the effects of roads, the direct and indirect effects of roads on the microbial diversity across sites. Um, and we've got, you know, a paper in the queue from um, Aria Yu on plant diversity. We've also got um, like a couple papers on like just the, the history of the neon sites um, that we're hoping might get a, a bite from ecological monographs. Um, since it's they're very kind of nice long stories about the sites and then the the data products, um, but the answer is yes. There's there's a lot in the queue, um, and if um, and I'm also you know I'm hoping that we can get this out sooner rather than later, so other people can also be using it to answer cool questions and stuff. And I'm also happy to kind of like talk with people because um, we've got a lot of knowledge at this point about the sites um, synthesized. Thank you so much. I know there's more questions we could go on, but we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much, Zani, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you again here, hopefully, in, in a month's time for our next seminar. Bye, everyone.